Not all trusts are created the same. And believe me, I do see a lot of trusts and a lot of them are good. And a lot of them are really, really bad. So very important information. A lot of people just don't know, is my trust a good trust or a bad trust? We're going to talk about what is a trust. We're going to talk about living trusts, and there are other types of trust other than a living trust, but how do you know if it's a good trust? And also, why are these things so long? Can't they just be like two pages or one page? Like, why do they have to be so long? We're going to kind of get into the why on that. Very important why to understand that a short form trust may not be the best type of trust for you. It might be, but it may not be as well. And is a living trust really best for you? So we'll talk about use cases for living trust and why people use them and why some people might not want to use them. And um, also a living trust, is it a complete estate plan? A living trust is part of a plan. And we'll talk a little bit how that works with other parts of your estate plan. And what happens if you have a bad trust? So what are some of the things that can happen? And you know, a preview on this, a little teaser is probate and taxes. So if you don't get this right, you might have to go through or your family might have to go through a probate process as well as pay more taxes. So I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, a real estate broker, securities insurance licensed, and a pilot. I've done thousands of estate plans. I'm very familiar with all the different types of formats that are out there. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, insight, sort of this insider's insight. These are the attorneys at our firm. We help the mass affluent, if you will. These are people who live in California primarily. If you live in another state, we also work with attorneys in other states, but um, helping the mass affluent with their wealth and passing that on and giving you peace of mind. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're doing this live. If you're watching it on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us uh, the, the, the like, the thumbs up on YouTube. Very important. I'm a lawyer. I'm talking. You know, my lips are moving. Words are coming out. This is not legal advice. There's no attorney client relationship. This is really information. It's taking a lot. This information that I've had for almost 30 years now, this practical experience and sharing that with you. So what is a trust? Let's start with the very basics. What are we talking about? Well, a trust is a legal document. Now, the analogy I'm going to use is a bucket. Obviously, a trust is not a bucket. It's a legal document. Trusts come from really Roman law. But really, for our purposes here, trusts come from about a thousand years ago when the Crusades started. These knights would say, "Hey, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to go east and I'm going to go on a crusade, and I've got property. I'm going to give this property. I trust you, you know, Johnny, to take care of this property, and I'm going to leave for three years." And these knights would come back, and then Johnny, who had been entrusted with the property, said, "I'm not giving it back to you." So then the kings went to the court. Uh, the court being the the uh, uh, the king and the king's like, I don't want to deal with this. Go to the church court, which is a court of chancery. That all distills down into American law into the modern probate court. So you can think of the probate court as almost like a church court, it, but we don't have that in the United States, but it's a very specific court. The probate court handles trust. So with a limited exception, you're really not going to civil court. If there's a problem internally with the trust, you're going to go to the probate court. And that's true pretty much throughout the United States. So what is a trust? A trust is a bucket, and this applies to a living trust or, or any other trust. It's a vessel. It's a container. It's a bucket with a handle, and the trustee holds on to the handle. So the trust itself is the bucket. This has to have assets. So a trust requires three things. It requires a trustee. It requires a beneficiary, somebody who gets the, the property. It also requires a thing of value, something. You have to have all three of those. Otherwise, you don't have a trust. So if you're missing one of those, that trust may go away. So when the trustee stops holding on to the handle, that handle passes to uh, somebody we call the successor trustee. Now, successor trustee, if you see this term, that typically means not the person who is serving right now as trustee, but it's a potential future trustee when that trustee dies, resigns, stops serving as trustee for whatever reason. Very important to understand that the trust does not go away just because a trustee dies or resigns does not mean that trust goes away. And the benefits of a, of a trust are, are many. And one of, one of them is privacy, avoidance of probate court. Um, you know, probate, the structure of probate is designed to pay creditors. It is not designed to protect your family. A living trust, by the way, uh, or trusts in general are designed primarily to protect your family and your loved ones. They're not designed to protect creditors. So most people would want to 
would want to protect their family more than they would want to protect the creditors, right? People they may uh, owe, owe money to or may not owe money to, right? So, uh, and minimiz minimization of taxes. So trusts are used quite frequently to minimize taxes, income taxes, capital gains taxes, uh, inheritance taxes, death taxes, all kinds of taxes, and uh, protection of an inheritance. So uh, living trust is better than a probate. Um, having your assets in a living trust is better than probating a will. And that trust can provide some really meaningful protection to protect the inheritance, your legacy. So when you leave this earth, your stuff stays here. And that's just a fact. What is left? Do you want that protected for your loved ones or not? I would say, yeah, most people want their legacy. They want their earthly wealth protected from future ex-sons-in-law and ex-daughters-in-law, creditors, taxes, the government. Most people want that protection. So people use a living trust um, for a variety of reasons, estate planning, tax planning, asset protection. And we're talking about this asset protection for the people who inherit. And again, avoiding probate uh, and preserving your legacy. And the idea here is that trusts are at the core of an estate plan. So a living trust isn't an estate plan in and of itself. It is part of an estate plan. You typically have a living trust, a will, a durable power of attorney for property, durable power of attorney for healthcare. You may have some deeds and some other, uh, some other assets, and we cover that in other webinars. So how do you know if you have a good living trust? What are some attributes of a good living trust? So it's kind of the flip of what we've been discussing. A living trust should communicate the legal rights, obligations, and responsibilities without requiring the court involvement. So without having to go out to the California Probate Code, it should be clear, clearly state what, it, what the trustee can and cannot do. A living trust should stand alone without having to look at other documents, so have very clear instructions. Uh, a trust... A good living trust tends to be a longer document. Now, just because it's long doesn't mean it's good, but they tend to be, the longer documents tend to have the ability to address more uh, permutations and combinations. And what about marriage or divorce? I, I think this is something that practitioners, um, you know, estate planning lawyers should be very forward thinking. They're not thinking so much about right now, but anticipating, hey, when Johnny inherits, gets his inheritance, is he going to blow it? Is he going to lose it in a divorce? What's going to happen? Lawyers should be thinking about that. Um, what if people die out of order? You know, a, a good estate plan, a good living trust will address what happens if people die out of order. What am I talking about? Well, my father-in-law recently passed away. He lost two sons, two of his five children, before he passed away. That's an example of people passing away out of order. And what if the successor tr trustee won't or can't serve for whatever reason? Uh, you got to sign it, right? And acknowledge it before notary public. Put your assets into the living trust. A good a good living trust has a good legal structure. It's usually created by a savvy attorney, someone who knows what they're doing. It should provide clear instructions for how your estate should be handled, not bare bones instructions. It should protect assets from probate. It should be designed. You know, and this is where you have the trust protector. Having a trust protector in there many times can keep you out of probate. And it should take care of beneficiaries in a way that aligns with your wishes um, versus not aligning with your wishes. Look at the document. Does it allow the beneficiaries to use the money in a way that you know you don't you don't want? What about taxes? Should how does your trust address tax mitigation? So you know many times, certainly in a larger estate, somebody will inherit, leave assets to uh, a significant amount of assets to a child, and then that child dies away close in time to when the parent passed away. And that then that property is taxed twice, so there are ways to mitigate that tax, uh, that tax liability. So we have we have a good legal structure example here. Jane creates a revocable trust for her two adult children, Sam and Lisa. Jane has a big estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, life insurance. James uh, Jane names herself as the initial trustee and designates Sam as successor trustee. Jane's trust provides that upon her death, the assets are to be used first to pay any outstanding debts and taxes that Jane might have. And afterward, the remainder is to be divided equally between Sam and Lisa and held in trust by a trustee to protect the uh, the inheritance from creditors, predators, and divorce. So that would be a good legal structure. Um, and again, so Jane wants to protect her children's inheritances, and she can use either what, what we call an inheritance protection trust. For you, If you're a lawyer watching this, it's a general needs trust. Uh, that typically there's some element of control, at least uh, for some element of control, a beneficiary directed trust or beneficiary controlled trust, or the dole it out trust, which is what it means, dole it out. So you either protecting your inheritance and you're kind of in charge, or you're not in charge because you're irresponsible with money, and that's a dole it out trust. So a third party 
sibling, trust company, where whatever it might be, is doling that money out to someone who is less than responsible. So a trust should be flexible. Uh, discretionary distributions. We see a lot of discretionary distributions in well-written trusts. What does that mean? The trustee can distribute for an interested trustee, which is defined as somebody who's an ancestor, a descendant, or a sibling, uh, or an employee, uh, typically distributes for health, education, maintenance, or support. Those are the four attributes in under the Internal Revenue Code that let someone who is kind of closer to you make distributions without having a negative tax consequence for the person holding that power, which would be the trustee. Uh, decanting provision, uh, meaning, you, you know, maybe you want you have a trust in California, you're like, I think I'd like to move this trust to Nevada and change the terms of the trust. That's decanting. It's like decanting wine from one vessel to another. That's what the term means. Trust protector is a person who has power of the trust, but is uh, but is not the trustee, can direct the trustee, can, can um, change the terms of the trust consistent with the person who created the trust, settlor, the settlor's intent. And um, a trust protector, probate courts have, look, look if there's something you reach the end of the line and the trustee can't do something or the trust needs to be modified and people have passed away. Normally, under most state law, you have to go to probate court, right? The, the court, it's required to modify the terms of those types of trust. A trust protector can have similar powers that a court, not all the powers, but similar powers. So uh, we do have an example here to, to protect the intent of the trustee. So this actually did come up in practice. Um, and this really did save the family a real a real headache in in court. Let's say Hal creates a living trust and leaves one two three B Street to Sonny, but after the trust is signed, Hal sells one two three B Street and buys four five six C Street. Hal dies thinking Sonny's going to get the other property four five six C Street. Everyone agrees that you know that property maybe Sonny was living in one two three B Street and Sonny says, hey, let's sell this one and buy this other property. Great. Everyone agrees that Sonny should get the property. The problem is. Hal never updated his estate plan. So when you look at, objectively, you look at that, you go, well, that property should be divided among the children, but everyone knows it's really Sonny's property. A trust protector can change the terms of that trust to make sure that Sonny gets the property without having to go to court. And here's the problem. A trustee must follow the terms of the trust. A trustee cannot deviate from the terms of the trust, even if the terms of the trust don't make sense as they do in this case. A trust protector can cure that. Now you might say, Wow, we're giving that trust protector a lot of power. Well, kind of, but who else has the power? A court, right? I think I would take the trust protector uh, over a court. And typically our firm serves as trust protector. There are other firms that serve as trust protector, um, other attorneys that can, other professionals. We typically recommend that someone who is knowledgeable with um, with trust and estate matters serve as, as trust protector. But by the way, we don't take any action as trust protector unless everyone's in agreement because I don't want to get hauled into court. Consequently, you don't see a lot of court cases about trust protectors because trust protectors want to make sure that everyone's on board, there's no disagreement, uh, and then we then we move forward. Okay, trustee ghosting. This, I would say, if there is a most common problem with trustees, this is up there. Um, this might be actually the most common problem with trustees. Mom dies eight years ago, Sonny becomes successor trustee, moves into mom's house, doesn't pay rent. Keeps all the money in mom's trust, stops communicating with the siblings, Abel and Baker. This happens all the time. Abel and Baker file a lawsuit in probate court for removal of Sonny, for Sonny to account, and for surcharge for the value of living in the home and other trust money that Sonny used. Because Sonny may not have the money. He may have spent it, right? Well, the court is going to surcharge him. And this involves the probate court legal fees and court delays. If mom had a trust protector, the trust protector might have been able to avoid court intervention. Um, by potentially removing Sonny as trustee, at least removing Sonny as trustee, but only a court can uh, order Sonny to uh, disgorge any benefit he took from the trust. So um, this does happen quite a bit, and this this can take a couple of years, quite frankly. If you're the trustee and you're ghosting your beneficiaries, don't do it because the law moves slowly, uh, but it moves. So you need to follow the terms of the trust. And if you're the, unfortunately, if you're the beneficiary in this situation, it's all too common it's very frustrating, and many people have to go to court to get this resolved. Well, how do you? Let's do a recap. How do you know if it's a good if it's a good living trust? Number one, signed. Number two, it's not going to be three pages. It's going to be longer, right? It might be 30, 40, 50, 60. That's a good indicator. Funding assets got have to go from the person who created the living trust in in a, in, in the living trust setting to the trustee of the trust. Now, in my case, 
I set up a living trust. I'm the trustee of my trust. The property's still in my name, right? When I stop being trustee, it goes into the name of the successor trustee. Uh, is it up to date? And does it have a good legal structure created by a reputable attorney? It's very, very important. And uh, does it protect your legacy and have a trust protector? So we have a lot of questions here I'm going to get to. We do have office locations throughout Northern California and Southern California. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and uh, click the little thumbs up, the, the like button. We really appreciate that. The next webinar we have, so if you're watching this on YouTube, you just keep watching because there's another webinar gonna, or another video going to pop up, but the Corporate Transparency Act, what you need to do now. So if you have an LLC or a corporation, you absolutely have to pay attention to this. This is massive, massive federal regulation by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which um, kind of a scary name. But it is a very, very important uh, new law where the government wants people who have LLCs, partnerships, and corporations to report information. They're going after two things. They're going after money laundering and terrorism, that in one bucket. Secondly, they're going after people who don't pay their taxes. So they're, they're ramping up enforcement of criminal activity and uh, tax evasion. So this, this affects pretty much every, potentially every corporation and LLC and partnership in the United States. So very, very important. We're going to open it up for questions. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just keep watching because magically another video is going to pop up right after this one. So why are trusts so long? Why are these things weighed in pounds and reams of paper? You know, a trust is a quarter ream or a half a ream of paper. Why are these things so long? Really what's going on here? So something to understand is a trust should communicate all the legal rights, obligations, and responsibilities without having to involve a court. So I would say the shorter a trust is, on a very high level, the greater the probability that some question will not be answered. What can the trustee do? What is the trustee prohibited from doing? What can the, the beneficiaries do? These are the people who inherit the property. So we have to address a lot of what ifs. That must be addressed in the document because a trust uh, by its nature, is limited to what's written in the trust. So a trustee can only do those things that uh, the trust says a trustee can do. And remember, the trustee is the person who holds on to the bucket. The person, the the trustee is the person who's driving the the trust in charge of of the assets. Um, a trustee's name goes on the assets, typically real estate or bank accounts. But this document has to stand alone on its own two legs and um, and has to has to give the trustee authority to perform many actions and be clear about it, okay? So you just can't say, I appoint this person to serve as trustee and hold the property for this beneficiary and that's it. The trustee has no power to do anything. So it's very important that you, you articulate the powers. Now, we're gonna talk about, this is gonna get a little academic. We have a lot of lawyers actually uh, watching our, our webinar who have signed up for our webinar. So I do wanna touch on something maybe a little esoteric, agency authority versus trustee authority. So I would say this is to give you context. This is the difference between a living trust and a durable power of attorney. So an agency relationship is contractual, meaning I appoint my agent. Uh, the, I, my, the I appoint somebody to have the power to take actions with respect to property that's in my name, right? So I set up a, a, a durable power of attorney and I name Abel as my agent. I give Abel the ability to make withdrawals from my retirement account, that IRA or that retirement account's in my name, but I give this third party, this agent, the ability to deal with the property. So it's very important with an agency relationship, this is not a trust relationship, you or you retain the title, your name is still on the assets. So you retain both the legal, what we call the legal and the beneficial ownership, and that that agent, the person who's acting on your behalf, can affect your legal rights and obligations to your property. So that's pretty heavy, right? So you would want to make sure if you're going to name somebody your agent or attorney, in fact, that this be a responsible person who's not going to misuse the power. And if an agent, you know, if you sign a durable power of attorney naming an agent, that agent can sign a binding contract that binds you, that you have to perform. So the agent isn't bound, but you are bound. And the agent is subject to the direction and control of you as the principal. So you create a durable power of attorney and you, uh, this, this agent is acting on your behalf and you say, you know, I don't want you to do this. I want you to do, do it this other way. You have the ability to direct that, that agent and you may end the agency at any time. And also it's very important to understand a durable power of attorney. If you don't remember anything, if this is just like, Jim, I don't understand what you're talking about. It's important to understand a durable power of attorney, the person named as your agent 
when that agent dies, uh, well, when you die, that power of attorney dies with you. When that agent dies, so if you just name Abel as your agent and that's it, and Abel dies, that power of attorney goes away. That's done. So that does not survive you. It does not survive the agent. Of course, you could name a successor agent, but what we're talking about here is we're going to draw a contrast between a durable power of attorney and trust, the agency authority and trust authority. So it's very important. A trustee of a trust derives the powers and duties by operation of law and equity, which is basically court rulings, and it's an equitable relationship. So what does that mean? Well, the trustee acts independently of you if you're the trustee, under, independently of the control of the set law. So if you create a trust and you name a trustee, that's not you. So in a living trust, typically it's you. But if you name somebody else that's not you, that person's acting independently with respect to the trust. You have no natural or no power to direct that trustee to do one thing or or another unless you reserve that power in the trust, okay? So that's why, again, that might make the trust a little bit longer. So you create a living trust and you say, I want to, you know, I don't want to serve as trustee. I'm going to appoint somebody else, but I want the power to swap out trustees. Well, if you don't put that in there, you may not have that power, right? So it's very important to all the powers that you want must be enumerated in the trust. Very important. A trustee takes legal title to property. This is called funding the trust. And this is a little spoiler alert, this is what can make a trust a bad trust is if an asset should be in the trust, but is not in the trust. That's a real problem because the trustee needs to be take title in the name of the trust with the durable power of attorney. You're not doing that. A trustee acts on behalf of the trust and binds the trust as if the trustee were the principal. So what this means is a trustee can buy and sell property and that's definitive. So if you create a trust and you name a, a trustee, and that person selling property, unless you have the power to direct that trustee or unless you have the power to change trustees, that trustee is going to sell the property. You have no power over that. Okay. Very important to understand. And again, not subject to the direction of by the beneficiaries, unless the beneficiaries are granted that power. But we typically don't see that power where the beneficiary is held by another person. And we'll cover that, but not subject to direction. So Durable power of attorney, significantly different. And for those lawyers who are listening um, to this, not really something we're taught in law school, but something that kind of makes sense. Um, trust beneficiaries cannot exercise authority over trust assets. Very important, the beneficiaries, the, the people who get the property under the trust cannot interfere with the exercise of the trustee's duty. So the trustee's doing his or her job, the beneficiary can agree or disagree, but they have no direct control to say a trustee should or shouldn't do something. So if you're the beneficiary of a trust and you don't agree with what the trustee is doing, you might have to go to probate court. You might have to go to the trust protector. You might have to look at another method, but you don't have some statutory ability to direct a trustee on what that person should or should not do. And the control over the trustees limited if, so if you're the creator of the trust, it's limited to, to ending the trust, right? In certain situations, if it's a revocable trust, or suing the trustee in court to compel performance. Um, now, a trust protector, we'll talk a little bit about that. A trust protector is someone who has power over the trust, someone who has power over the trustee, but is not the trustee and not necessarily the creator of the trust. That trust protector can say, hey, trustee, I don't like what you're doing. If you don't do, do it the way I want you to do it, I'm going to remove you. So it's indirect control. That's typically held by a third independent party. Um, and we cover that in our other materials on our on our YouTube page. And when the trustee dies, the trust doesn't die. The successor trustee, remember, you hear the term successor trustee, that means a future trustee. And if a trustee, this is very important, if a trustee becomes insolvent, the beneficiaries um, possess rights to claim trust property over the trustee's own creditors. So if you have a trustee who becomes insolvent, that's a real problem because the trustee's name is on a lot of assets, right? And if that trustee's in bankruptcy, then those beneficiaries come forward and they say, well, wait a minute, this person who went into bankruptcy is uh, doesn't really own the property. We're the beneficial owners as, as beneficiaries, but those beneficiaries have to come forward and claim that. So durable powers of attorney, what does this all mean? All right, on a very high level, some durable powers of attorney are two pages and they're effective. It's because the principal is delegating to an agent certain powers and that agent can act on behalf of the principal's behalf as as the principal could a trust by their nature must be more detailed so this is one reason why a trust you don't see two page trusts i mean you might really bad ones right but this is why you don't see really really short trusts is because you you have to articulate all of these powers and duties and guidelines for the trustee it has to be in the document it's important to understand at least in california there is no form living trust so if somebody says hey i'm going to form durable power of attorney 
It's in the probate code. There's a form. I want to form advanced healthcare directive. It's in the probate code. There's even a form will, but there's no form living trust. So trusts have to contain detailed specific language at trustee powers, duties, and restrictions. So what can this trustee do? What can the trustee not be able to do? What are what are some some um some constraints? And the rights, all the rights that the settler of the trust retains. So if you say, I'm creating this trust and I'm naming someone else as trustee. I have the power to change who that person is as trustee. I might have the power to take money out of the trust, whatever it is that should be written in the trust. And then some beneficiaries have certain rights under the trust. A beneficiary might have a right to appoint the trustee. If that, if the beneficiary doesn't like the trustee, it's a very common provision. A beneficiary might have a right to withdraw money. A beneficiary might have a right to compel the trustee to make a distribution, a lot of different types of powers in there. And then also the nature and extent of the trust protector powers. Remember, a trust protector is typically somebody who has power over the trust, but is not the trustee. Why would you need that? We're going to get into that in a couple of slides. So why are living trusts in particular so long? Well, living trusts, think about all the things that living trusts have to address. They have to address what happens, you know, if you create a living trust. Your living trust should address what happens if you become incapacitated. What do I mean? You're not able to be trustee. You have a stroke, dementia, art, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. You're not dead. You're still living, but you're not serving as trustee. So that means somebody else needs to serve as trustee, and that's still your money. Okay, so it's not in, in most living trusts, in the vast majority. That is still your money. That's not That money's not going to anyone. You're still the beneficiary, but somebody else is in charge. Someone else puts their name on your account, right? So Johnny, trustee of your trust, Johnny's name is on that account and using that money for your benefit. Well, you have to address that. What about an inheritance? You know, a lot of people, it used to be that say, hey, when I die, my kids, my three kids get everything. Well, what if one of those three kids is in the middle of, of a divorce when they inherit? How will that Im impact the divorce? It does. What if they, you know, the child inherits and 10 years later, there's a divorce? How does, you know, does that impact the the divorce? Yes, it does. It's gonna there'll be a question. Is this community property or marital property? Is it separate property? So it's important to address that because what we're talking about here is your legacy. Just think about the assets that you have. If you're leaving this to your children, I'm assuming you love them most of the time. You're gonna leave these assets to your children. Most people say, I want to protect it from a future ex-son-in-law or future ex-daughter-in-law, right? I mean, that makes sense. I want to protect it from another round of taxation when my child passes away, right? I want my grandchild to inherit that money without having my, my child to have to pay more estate taxes or death taxes. So very, very important considerations. These should be addressed in a trust. And this is why trust can get longer and longer. What about disputes, right? What if somebody challenges the trust? Do you want that person to forfeit their rights to the trust. Well, that adds a few pages. Um, what about the trustee powers? The trustee powers can be, you know, 10, 15, 20 pages, all the things that a trustee can do. Now, some lawyers might say, Jim, well, can't you just say, I give my trustee the powers under probate code section, blah, blah, blah. I, I would say theoretically, you could do that. Here's the problem. You go and you try and sell a piece of property. There's an attorney at a title company, probably in a basement in New York City. I mean, literally, these attorneys are in basements in New York City, or maybe they're in their crummy uh, one-bedroom apartment somewhere. But they're, they don't know California law. They're going to say it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do in the trust. It is best practices to put every power you would want your trustee to have, put that in the trust, put it in writing. So there's no question. No one has to look up anything. And um, and when you go to sell that piece of property, you want to make sure that the trustee has the power to sell property, because if you don't grant that trustee power to sell the real property, you're very well probably going to have a pretty significant problem. What if a successor trustee can't or won't serve? That would be an alternate successor trustee te technically, but you might want to think about if I don't serve, I'm going to name um, you know, Abel, and if Abel can't do it, I'll name Baker, and if Baker can't do it, I'll name Charlie. So depending on your situation, you might want to name, um, you know, a successor trustee or two. So trust, and there's a little graphic here if you're watching the video. Um, the simplified, uh, the Helen Wanda Lopez Trust is simplified, but it is in its nature very complex. So this gets back to why are living trusts so long? California needs to meet legal requirements in order to be valid. You got to be that has to be created by someone 18 years or older, have clear intent, have a valid purpose, have identifiable assets. Okay. Have a trustee. What happens if your trustee goes off the rails? What happens if you have a problem trustee? The beneficiaries can go to court to enforce the trust. That is not a challenge, right? So if the trustee is stealing, that happens. 
The beneficiaries can take the trustee to court and say, judge, the trustee is stealing, remove the trustee. That is not a challenge. A trust protector can remove a trustee. And again, trust protector makes the trust longer. So why are trusts so long? You may want to have these powers. So trustees do go off the rails. I will say that most clients make good choices. So if you're watching this, it's not like this happens a lot. Most people make good choices when it comes to trustee, with the one exception if uh, somebody's being manipulated by an evil person who works themselves in to be trustee. All right, that that's problematic. But I would say, by and large, most people do make good choices and, and pick good people as trustees. But again, it's it's you know a a fraction uh, that that go off the rails, and um, there has to be at least one beneficiary. So you you know you can't set up a living trust and say, gee, I don't know who gets my stuff when I pass away. You got to name someone. Right, it's an individual, a charity. Your your intestate heirs. These are people who inhab, inher, inherit absent a will, but that should be addressed, and it must be signed. Right. So I can't tell you how many people come in. They say, "I did this living trust ten years ago. Here's a copy of it." One of the first things I do is I go to the signature page, and probably about twenty five percent of the time, the document's not signed. So um, it's very important to have that signed copy of a trust. So. Living trust has to document all the have to document all the assets being transferred into the trust. So typically, you'll have a schedule of assets, a schedule A, or a, some type of um, listing of assets, some recitation that typically is a starting point. That is not sufficient to actually fund the trust to make that transfer because if you have assets that have a title, that title needs to go into the name of the trustee. Living trusts need to include trustee powers. What can the trustee do and not do? And I would say you should consider having a trust protector in a trust because a trust it's much better to have a trust with a trust protector, uh, certainly if you have a continuing trust, because things do come up and we'll give you a couple of examples. So 